know that the processes that underlie insect growth and development can be used to help solve crimes? It's part of a field called forensic entomology. In its broadest sense, forensic entomology involves the use of insects and other arthropods in legal investigations and as evidence in the legal system. Forensic entomology can be considered a multidisciplinary field as it involves applied biology, ecology, criminology, and entomology. Insects and other arthropods have been used in criminal investigations since 13th century China, although adoption of insects as crime fighters has been sporadic in different parts of the world. Despite this long history, the science of forensic entomology was not developed until the late 18th century. The most widely recognized form of forensic entomology is medico-legal forensic entomology, in which the study of insects is used in criminal investigations involving injury or ailment, most notably homicides. I'd like to introduce you to a forensic entomologist, Dr. Gail Anderson, whose insight and research has provided evidence for a number of forensic cases. She will give us a brief overview of the roles insects can play in criminal investigations. I'm a professor in the School of Criminology at Simon Fraser University. I'm also the Associate Director of the school and I'm the co-director of the Centre for Forensic Research. I'm a forensic entomologist. Uh, that means I look at the insects that colonize a dead body or a dead, hu dead human body or a dead animal body. Uh, and from that, I can work out many different things about the investigation, primarily how long the insects have been colonizing the body, which gives us an idea of how long a person's been dead, as well as other things such as whether the body's been moved or disturbed. And I do this as a consultant while I'm at the university. So I get called in by police or coroners or SPCA or wildlife officials. One of my senior supervisors, Dr. John Borden, had been very involved in forensic entomology at SFU. He'd been somebody who'd uh, networked with the police in the coroner's office. He didn't actually do it, but he had somebody else actually doing the casework who had decided he didn't like to do it anymore. And so John was left without somebody doing forensic entomology. And there was me, an innocent little 25-year-old grad student, walking past his office. And he said, Gail, how do you fancy being a forensic entomologist? And I said, cool, what's that? Uh, and so he explained it to me and I said, well, that sounds kind of gross, but we'll, uh, we'll give it a year and we'll see. And that was uh, a long time ago. Well, primarily we look at the length of time that insects have colonized the body. So if I can work out the period of insect activity, then I can infer the length of time the person has been dead. So for instance, if the insects in the body are seven days old, then that person has been dead for at least seven days. Now we can do other things such as whether or not the body's been moved or disturbed by looking at the kinds of insects because different insects will colonize in different regions. So some insects will colonize in an urban area, others in a rural area, something like that. And so we can tell whether perhaps the body's been moved or if the body's been buried and then uncovered by the killer coming back to check it was still there or retrieve evidence and then reburied again. We can look at the times of colonization. We could also be involved in looking at um, toxicology, whether somebody was poisoned or perhaps was drugged, and the insects can act as, um, as a toxicological uh, specimen, just as a piece of liver could. But when the body's de too decomposed, we can do the... The most important thing is to get an entomologist out to the crime scene immediately. I should be there at the scene collecting the insects at the scene. Sometimes that doesn't always happen. Sometimes I don't get called till the body gets to the morgue. And at that point, uh, the pathologist notices those insects, and that's when I get called. But ideally, I would like to collect them at the scene. And I would collect a certain percentage of them alive, and a certain percentage I will preserve. And once I've collected the insects, I'll bring them back here to the lab, and then I'll analyze them. So the preserved insects will be catalogued, so I can work out what stage or what instar they've reached uh, in their development. And then the live insects I'll rear through to adulthood, so that I can work out what the species is. So for instance, I could look at the species and say, well, it's Formia regina. And when I look at the preserved specimens from the same area, then I'll say, well, they're second instar or second stage larvae. And therefore I can then work out how long it takes that species to get to that stage under the temperatures of the crime scene. Well, there's many things, but the main factors are those that relate to development. So what are the factors that affect insect development? Well, insects are cold-blooded animals. So uh, they're 
their development is almost entirely dependent on temperature. There are other things like nutrition and uh, humidity and things, but primarily it's temperature. As temperature increases, they develop more rapidly. And as it decreases, they develop more slowly. Uh, within limits and with all sorts of caveats, that's a relatively linear relationship, making it a predictable relationship. So that's the number one thing that we're involved in when we're looking at insects at a body. But we're also involved in the successional ecology of insects because different insects will colonize the body over time. So insects will colonize at different stages of the decomposition. So as the body decomposes, it goes through a whole bunch of very rapid uh, decompositional changes. It changes physically, chemically, biologically. And each one of those changes is attracted to different groups of insects. Uh, for instance, some insects can only eat a fresh body. Literally, they can only actually feed on a body when it's fresh, when the tissues are, are wet. Uh, some species can only feed on the body when it's dry uh, and cannot feed on it when it's wet. They wouldn't be able to survive. So as the body changes in a predictable manner, the different insects that colonizes the body over time will change. And so understanding the ecology of the insects and their feeding habits and also their relationship with the different bacteria that inhabit the body are also very important in uh, establishing how long the, those insects have been on the body. I think there's lots of things that we don't know yet, uh, but what's exciting is that there's so much research going on. Uh, there's lots of stuff we don't know and we don't understand. There's a lot more databases we need to develop across this continent and many others. Uh, North America is fairly fortunate. We've got a lot of researchers here, but in other parts of the world, there are not so many people working in this area. So um, people are having to break the round that I broke 20 years ago in trying to convince the police to get involved with this and use this. We're learning now very recently about the interrelationships between bacteria and insects on the body and how each impact uh, each other. And I think that's going to be very important in the future. I don't really have a favorite insect, but um, I'm most knowledgeable about the blowflies in the Californidae. They're a very beautiful insect and a very major part of our ecosystem. And I think they're very, uh, under-respected, shall we say. Arthropods at the scene of a crime can help investigators determine the time since the victim's death based on the stage of colonization of the corpse at the time of investigation. This is referred to as the post-mortem interval. Once the arthropods on a corpse have been identified, knowledge about the development of the species can be used by forensic entomologists. Measurements of insect development, along with temperature records at the crime scene, allow forensic entomologists to employ degree day models to estimate the time of colonization by insects on a corpse, which may in turn indicate time of death. Degree day models are primarily used for situations in which the body is discovered in an early stage of decay, with the first colonizers still present on the corpse. This is usually within the first month after death. Let's go through the application of degree day models to forensic entomology together, step by step. Step one, collect the insect colonizers on the corpse. The insect colonizers are dominated by blowflies. It is important to collect any stage of the first generation of insect colonizers present from eggs to pupae. Any of these stages can be used to help estimate the post-mortem interval. Female blowflies arrive quickly to carrion, including human cadavers, to lay eggs. The eggs develop and the first instar maggots emerge. The maggots feed on the carrion and develop through subsequent larval instars. Upon the completion of larval development, the maggots leave the carrion resource in search of a pupation site in the soil, usually nearby. After a period of time spent as pupae, the adult flies emerge. Remember that the length of time required to complete this life cycle is strongly influenced by temperature and can be predicted with species-specific degree day models. Step two is to correctly identify the species of maggots. Accurate species identification ensures that the correct degree day models are used to calculate the developmental time of the insects. However, it is often difficult to identify maggots to species level based on morphology alone. Fortunately, Advances in genetic techniques have alleviated this problem and allow investigators to accurately identify large numbers of specimens to species level in a relatively short amount of time. Alternatively, some of the maggots can be reared to adulthood to confirm the species identification based on morphological traits of the adult insects, which is the more traditional and more common method. 
Step three is to estimate the developmental stage of the maggots. This can be estimated based on morphology, such as the number of spiracles, or by comparing the maggot body length and dry weight against reference data. These methods are used because maggots lack other measurable structures like head capsules that could be used to infer developmental stage. Step four for the investigators is to collect short-term climate data for the site where the corpse was found. This data includes temperature, rainfall, and cloud cover. Additional information like vegetation cover and details about treatment of the body after death, such as whether it was buried or wrapped, are also recorded, since this can affect how long it takes the initial colonizers to find the corpse. Step five, the final step, is to calculate the post-mortem interval based on the number of elapsed degree days experienced by the collected insect. A comparison of the maggot life stage collected from the body with degree day calculations from records of ambient temperatures at the crime scene allows investigators to estimate when the eggs were first laid on the body. This in turn provides an approximation of the time of death, assuming there were no other factors like burial or submersion of the body, which could have inhibited the female fly's ability to find the cadaver and deposit eggs on it. The post-mortem interval obtained through analysis of the life stage and development of maggots is applicable only to the first generation of maggot colonizers on the corpse in the days or weeks after death. Once the first generation of adult flies has emerged, it becomes impossible to determine what generation of maggots is present. At this point, estimates for when insects began to colonize the dead body need to be determined based on the stage of insect colonization. As we have hinted at previously, knowledge of the necrophagous insect community can be useful in forensic entomology. Specifically, the predictable waves of carrion insect colonization on a cadaver and the stage of development of each species can both contribute to the time of death estimations. In forensic entomology, this is referred to as insect succession. Here, we use the term insect succession to mean the change in species composition associated with the decomposing body over time. Note that despite its name, waves of insect succession on a corpse can sometimes include incidental non-insect arthropods like millipedes and mites. To categorize stages of insect succession, knowledge of insect species identification and feeding guilds is required. There are three main groups of arthropods that colonize a corpse. They are necrophages, predators, and incidental species. The initial stages of decomposition after death result from the activity of microbes in or around the cadaver. Animals that feed on the dead tissue, the necrophages, can quickly locate the body after death because they are highly tuned to cues emitted from the decaying body. Different necrophages insects will exploit different parts of the carrion, such as tissues, fluids, stomach contents, or bones. The time of different species arrival depends on the resources available at the time and species-specific diet preferences. Examples of necrophagous insects include blowflies, houseflies, fleshflies, hoverflies, floridflies, cheeseflies, dermestid beetles, and carrion beetles. In addition to insects that feed directly on carrion, there are also predators that feed on both the corpse and the necrophagous insects. Common predators include ants, wasps, flies, and a variety of beetle species. Incidental organisms are species that use the corpse to supplement their regular habitat. They do not necessarily feed on the cadaver, but utilize resources on and near it for habitat and shelter. Examples of such arthropods include isopods, mites, and millipedes. Not taking into account differences in decompositional rates due to environmental factors, there are five distinct stages of decomposition, each of which is associated with a different wave of arthropod colonization. Through identification of the assemblage of insects present on a corpse and the stage of insect development at the time of the investigation, forensic entomologists can estimate the time of death based on the stages of decomposition of the corpse. The first stage of decomposition occurs while the corpse is still fresh. 
As microorganisms initiate the decomposition process, volatile organic compounds are released from the decaying carcass, which include acids, cyclic hydrocarbons, oxygenated compounds, sulfur, and nitrogen compounds. These act as olfactory cues that attract the first wave of necrophagous insects. This first wave includes some female blowflies, flesh flies, and house flies that deposit eggs on the corpse. Maggots that hatch from these eggs feed on the dead tissues. The presence of developing maggots attracts carnivorous arthropods, such as carabid beetles, that feed on some of the maggots or on the corpse as well. The second stage of decomposition is known as putrefaction, or the bloated stage. The second wave of arthropods arrives at this stage. Initial colonizers are now joined by other fly species, such as the cheese flies and phaneid flies. During putrefaction, beetles also begin to arrive at the site, attracted by the body itself and the fly eggs and maggots, which they consume as well. Beetles associated with this stage of decomposition include some rove beetles, carrion beetles, hyster beetles, and checkered beetles. Black putrefaction, or active decay, is the stage of decomposition that follows putrefaction. At this stage, the fully developed maggots that colonize the carrion during the initial stages of decomposition begin to exit the discolored cadaver to pupate in the soil. Adult flies present on the carrion also begin to diminish in number as the corpse becomes unsuitable for maggot development and beetles begin to dominate. The next stage of decomposition is called butyric fermentation or advanced decay. By this time, little flesh and only hair, skin, and bones will be left on the corpse. This phase of decomposition is named for the butyric acid that is produced during this stage. During this phase, most fly maggots have pupated and populations of adult flies are completely replaced by various beetle species and predatory mites. The final stage of decomposition is called dry decay. Little remains of the corpse at this time other than bones, cartilage, and perhaps a few pieces of dry skin. At this stage of decomposition, most beetle species begin to abandon the corpse until only the keratin-feeding beetles from the family Dermestidae remain. As scavengers, these beetles and their larvae feed on animal protein that few other organisms feed on, such as skin, hair, and feathers. In fact, colonies of dermestid beetles are often used to clean flesh and hair from vertebrate skeletons in research and museum collections. That said, these beetles are also considered pests of museum specimens as, if left unchecked, they can feed on and destroy entire natural history collections. Meanwhile, incidental, non-carrion feeding organisms such as centipedes, millipedes, isopods, snails, and cockroaches begin to arrive at the corpse. Medico-legal forensic entomology can provide investigators with much more information than just the time of death. For example, investigators can learn about how the body was treated after death. If the body was moved from the scene of the crime, some of the insects found on the body may be present only at the original location. This tells investigators that the body was moved and may indicate the area where the murder occurred. The location of insect colonizers on the corpse itself can provide evidence for the presence and position of wounds at the time of death, which may inform investigators about the cause of death. Insects colonize orifices first since they are easy to access. However, if there are wounds present on the body, insects will colonize these first, drawn in by the scent of blood. If insect activity is concentrated away from the orifices, this is an indication of the probable site of a wound. Insects can also inform investigators about the presence of drugs in a victim. Even if there is no flesh on the body that can be tested, maggots will bioaccumulate drugs as they feed. The insects can then be analyzed to determine if and what types of drugs were present in the body. There are many factors that can influence the rate of decomposition of a corpse. Remember, for example, that a body that has been buried or wrapped is more difficult for necrophagous insects to reach and colonize, thereby slowing their decomposition rate. If the victim was frozen after death, 
then insect evidence would only provide information about the date that the body was exposed. Similarly, variation in ambient temperatures can influence rates of decomposition and insect succession. A corpse exposed to direct sunlight will likely experience higher temperatures and therefore undergo faster rates of decomposition and succession compared to a corpse that had been left in the shade. All of these factors need to be taken into account when estimating a postmortem interval using forensic entomology. In cold regions, like here in Canada, forensic entomology can only be used during the warm seasons, since there is very little insect activity in the winter. Although this is usually a limitation, insect evidence on a victim found in the spring can tell experts that the victim was killed during the previous fall. A final drawback to forensic entomology is that much research is required before insects can be employed in a forensic investigation. The species that make up the waves of insect succession vary from region to region, and separate models must be created for each region. In addition, degree day models vary enormously between species and must be developed for the initial colonizers found in the region. Although there are challenges associated with the practical use of forensic entomology, the information it can provide is well worth the effort.